life. Yet, when each of these rules was passed, someone believed this rule, that rule, this is necessary, it's going to make us safer. This one is going to make the marketplace more fair. And so they keep passing more. Thousands of new pages every year. Doesn't any politician see that there's a problem with that? Well, yes, finally, for the first time in my career, some politicians get it. And one is the new senator from Wisconsin, Ron Johnson. What made you get it? What made me get it? Well, certainly I lived my life under regulations in the private sector, so I saw the, the harm the government can actually do not only to business, but job creation and, and those middle income individuals that President Obama says he's always wanting to protect. So no, I mean, government regulation is necessary. It can be helpful, but far too often it, it just you know, flies in the face of common sense. And of course, the thing we really need to be more concerned about in a free society is an all-powerful government that actually can ruin lives. And that's really what uh, I'm trying to point out is the victims of government. All right, well, let, let's talk about uh, when it's necessary in a moment, but y your background may explain why you care about this. You unlike so many politicians, you're, you weren't a lawyer by trade, you ran a business, you were in the plastics business. A manufacturer, right. And, and I can't imagine what kind of regulations you ran up against, but you saw how the, any bureaucrat could torture you. Absolutely, and, and, and John, now that I'm here and I'm hearing, I see businesses coming day after day talking about this regulation or that regulation, basically putting them out of business. And what government regulators don't understand is the law of diminishing returns. You know, so some of these regulations may be appropriate, but it goes well beyond common sense and does real harm to businesses, which means it does real harm to job creation, since there's real harm done to real people. So for your Victims of Government website, you made a little movie about one victim, a man from Granite City, Illinois, who finally took action to fight floods in his neighborhood. Granite City, Illinois, has suffered severe flooding since the 1950s. More than once, the White House declared the area a disaster. The Corps issued study after study after study, yet the Corps did nothing. Until a Granite City man decided to take a bold step. He never thought working on his own property would cost him almost everything. And what do you mean cost him almost everything? Well, he almost went bankrupt. Basically, he could not develop the land at all for 23 years. The, the, for 23 years, your movie goes on to explain that when that Illinois man tried to obey the government's regulations, the EPA told him he needed to get a permit from the Corps of Engineers. Steve invested another $200,000 to apply for this permit. That was 14 years ago. The permit never arrived. 23 years later, after buying the dump at the end of the street, Steve is on the verge of bankruptcy. What difference does government intrusion make? For Steve and his family, everything. More than a dozen years waiting for the permit, we called the Corps of Engineers. They say, we followed correct policy and procedures to enforce the sure. law worked extensively with him and our partner agencies. They, they're comfortable with this slow death. Absolutely. These laws are written. They give regulators all the power and the regulators take the power. And so even though Stephen Lathrop did everything right, he got all the necessary state and local permits. He tried to comply with every rule and regulation. He did comply with every rule and regulation, but there's always just a little bit of you know, wiggle room for the regulators. And that's what's so absurd about this. In eight studies, the Army Corps basically recommended turning that dump into a lake or channels to mitigate flooding. And by the way, they, if they would have done it, it would have cost $4 million. Stephen Lathrop did it for $100,000. The flooding did stop. But then the Corps comes back and says, you know what, Stephen, that was a wetland. You turned a wetland into a lake. You know, shame on you. And that, then they start threatening him. And, and that's just the problem with, with an all-powerful government. Uh, Americans are, are basically at government's mercy. They become the victims of government. And we see that time and time again across all the agencies. And you earlier said there's some things that need regulation. What? Why do the feds need to regulate? Well, listen, I think food and drug safety, I think transportation safety, vehicle safety. You know, we actually do have to you know, monitor airplanes in the sky. Yeah, I think most Americans are environmentalists. I think some common sense environmental regulations do make sense. But again, when you have the EPA, 
that regulates ozone, gets it down to 75 parts per million. We do that successfully, and then I guess you got an ozone department there going, well, we completed that, now what should we do? I know, let's knock it down to 65 parts per million at a cost of about a trillion dollars over 10 years. Again, it just gets beyond the point of diminishing returns, and government just is not very good at, at interjecting any kind of common sense in terms of what it does. It just follows these rules. They follow them to the letter. Regulators are very risk averse. Let's face it, their job is regulating things. And so they keep looking for more things to regulate at great harm to our economy and at great harm to individuals. Thank you, Senator Ron Johnson. Good luck with your victims of government campaign. I hope uh, other politicians will start paying attention to these victims. But since most of them well, don't, thanks. it's good that we have groups like Flow. Mm -hmm. Its website says they're devoted to liberating the entrepreneurial spirit. Michael Strong is CEO of Flow. He's an entrepreneur himself, and so is his wife, Magat Wade. You learned about this when you started a, a charter school. Indeed. Uh, charter schools are designed to create innovation in the public school um, system. In the third year of operation, our charter schools ranked 36th best school in this country. But we were. 36th best in the country. But this we is were. In New Mexico, not known for great education. Exactly, exactly. But we were constantly being attacked by regulators. At one point, the toilet uh, roll holders were deemed to be six inches too low, and they threatened to shut down the school. This was a direct attack by the public school district. They wanted to attack us, so they sick the regulators on us to shut us down. You didn't have the right file folders in a file. At one point in an audit, we were dinged because there were a certain number of file folders. Might have been eight. I don't even remember. We get dinged on an audit for nothing. Now, Magat, you run a skincare company, mm -hmm. and you're from Senegal. Mm -hmm. So you've seen, I mean, in some ways, I guess you could say it's a good part about America. Most of Africa is worse. Yes, I think it's very counterintuitive for most people when they think just in the makeup room, I was talking to the lady doing my makeup and she was like, oh really, you're going to talk about regulations in Africa? I tend to think that there is not enough regulation, maybe that's why it's such a mess. And I said, it's the whole opposite, as a matter of fact. We have so many regulations where we're strangling, we're, we're strangling, being strangled. Um, just starting a business is almost impossible because you have to bribe people, you have to get a thousand permits? <clears throat> well, let's just take the s situation of Senegal. You have at least 10, 12 uh, different entities that you have to go to to get things done. And at each level, it's one more room for someone to block you so they can get bribes from you, which delays us. And um, also the cost, the cost. Uh, here in 10 minutes, I can set up an LLC I'm sitting in the comfort of New York State, and I'm setting up an LLC in Delaware. Done. Within 10 minutes. Delaware is the easiest. Delaware being the easiest, more, you know, more, more, um, more friendly to businesses. And within 10 minutes, it's done. It's b almost free to do it. In Senegal, you're talking months and months and months of operations, um, thousands of miles of going from office to office to office, and uh, a few thousand dollars to get things done. Not everybody can do that. So one more modern, accessible example of this, eBay. What happened there? Well, with eBay, France wanted to license it as if it was a real auctioner, and there's long licensing So process. eBay already existed in America. They just started right. doing it. But France says... You, you need to have a license as an auctioneer because it's an auction. And it took much longer to get the eBay going in France because of this. I always like to think... Three years of dispute. Exactly. When you're starting a business, you don't have time to mess around. eBay is now one of the largest economies on earth and had... Every country had all of these obstacles. We might not have eBay. I always think, you know, extraordinary uh, difference. And the assumption in America is that these regulations are needed to protect cons and to protect us from the big businesses. You say that's a myth. In almost every case, the big guys use regulation to keep the small guys out. They can afford the lawyers and the compliance departments, and they're happy if that keeps small entrepreneurs like you out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, again, I, I oftentimes fight with the ILO um, because of these... Fight with the who? The ILO, the International Labor Organization. I take a country, possible me to fire an employee. Whether the employee is doing their job or not, it is, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, the combatant road to get rid of an employee who is stealing from you, not doing their work, and uh, rotting the, the... Yeah, it's impossible. 
And it, it, this is because the labor unions have persuaded the government to pass laws saying if you fire someone, you must show us this documentation? Or yes. what stops you? Just fire the person. <clears throat> it, no, it, the laws are so complicated that um, it, before you can fire anyone, you ha it's, it's just... It's, it's almost impossible to fire anyone, legally speaking, without having to pay, without having to pay, which is which raises the cost of doing business. So result is, I like to say, if I can't fire you, I can't hire you. It is that simple. Thank you, Magat and Michael. Uh, later, new ways to save money when traveling and also to earn money from your own house. Wendy Robin is a professional makeup artist. She does makeup for movies and TV shows. She's worked on the Bernie Mac show, done Billy Crystal's makeup, as well as The Rock. And she's taught other people how to apply makeup. But now, Nevada bureaucrats have told you, Wendy, you better get a teaching license if you're gonna teach people how to do makeup. Immediately, or we're gonna fine you thousands of dollars. Tim Keller from the Libertarian Law Firm, the Institute for Justice, helps people like Wendy fight back. So this came as a surprise to you. You got a letter. I actually received a phone call from the state board saying that they would be fining me if I kept my school open and um, that I would be subject to several fines um, if I didn't close down and become a cosmetology school to teach become makeup a school. artistry. And becoming a school, you had a little storefront mm -hmm. store. You would have to expand it to have 5,000 square feet of space. Yes. And what else? Well, they basically said, you know, you can't teach makeup. You're in violation of, of laws by teaching makeup. And that I had to open up cosmetology school, which would cost me thousands of dollars, probably up to 100000 or more. You'd to have to have, have dryers, yes. shampoo bowl for stuff you don't use. Exactly. And Tim, this is not unusual. No, unfortunately it's not. Um, oftentimes we see states giving uh, state boards tremendous authority to enforce laws, and it's the regulated industry itself that controls these state boards. They have a vested financial interest in keeping it out competitive threats like Wendy from the market. And we asked the Nevada State Board, we left a message, they didn't call back, but we did reach the president of the National Interstate Council of State Boards of Cosmetology, who says, without licensing, without training, we will have individuals spreading disease. You're gonna spread disease. As Bernie Mac would say, it's a bunch of bull. <laughs> it really is. I mean, what I do is completely different. I teach media makeup artists how to do makeup for film, for television, for commercials, for print. It has had nothing to do with cosmetology. And you've had a successful career. Other famous actors you've worked with? Like I have. I work with Tilda Swinton. I work with Matt Damon. I've been a makeup artist for 25 plus years. I have a teaching credential from private post-secondary. I'm not somebody that has that's a fly-by-night person right, trying to teach people. But they've won so far. They've shut your school down. They have. It's really unfortunate. They have shut me down. You know, based on all these fines, the rules, regulations, and they've cost me over a hundred thousand dollars at least. In and revenue. Tim, but we are going to open her back up. There is simply no reason to force Wendy to comply with the cosmetology regulations. And yet, I sense the public is against us on this. A national poll found 82% of the people said sta if states stopped licensing, safety would decline. That is absolutely not true. If the state has any. People think it will, though. Well, <laughs> it won't. Um, if the state has any vested interest in protecting the public health and safety, it can do so without fencing out competition. Requiring people to spend two years and tens of thousands of dollars in cosmetology school simply to cut hair and do nails is absurd. But they don't think they're at war against the little guy. Oh, they are absolutely at war against the little guy. Both Wendy's business and our other client, Lisette Waugh, had thriving makeup artistry schools until the state board came in and shut them down. Thank you, Wendy and Tim. I should point out that in our pile of 170,000 rules, that does not even include the state regulations that torture people like you. That's 
The federal regulation alone, it's bad enough, but state and local rules are as bad or worse. And coming up, another example of that. You need a place to stay, but you don't want to spend a ton of money? There are cool new options available, but local regulators want to crush them. When you arrive in your new city, we already have a bunch of services lined up to make you feel right at home. My kids grew up. They moved out. I have two empty rooms in my house. Gee, I bet some New York tourists would like to rent those rooms. They could save some hotel money, and I could make some money. But how would they find out about my rooms? Here's a way. Internet sites like Airbnb and Roomarama make it easy. They have rating systems so I can see the person who wants to rent, see if they have a good reputation, and they can see if I do. So great, come stay with me. But no, wait a second. Apparently I may not rent those rooms legally. Two years ago, my state passed a law that makes most of what apartment rental sites do illegal. What's that about? Gia Antio, the founder of Rumorama, says she knows. What's it about? Um, I think a, a large part of it comes from the fact that you know short-term rentals grew in popularity or have been growing in popularity over the last couple of years. Um, and that has posed maybe some competition to hotels. The hotel business loses business if I rent. Mm -hmm. And they are a bigger business. They have lobbyists. Mm -hmm. They contact the legislators. Mm -hmm. Yes. But the business goes on anyway. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, the business goes on. I mean, we, we operate in many different countries, many different cities in the world. Um, 500 cities in America. 5,000 cities around the world. Um, so and 100,000 properties and growing every day. And even here in New York, where it's largely illegal, people are doing it anyway. It's, uh, you know, we're a platform, uh, so anyone can go up there and list their property. Here in New York, some of your customers were fined 800 bucks. Yes. And they so. got off the site. Yes, exactly. All right, but thousands, today, a mm -hmm. thousand people are renting this way. So oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean. So, it, so explain how it works. You have, I, I, we have these samples here. Mm -hmm. This is a room, cozy private room in a brand new apartment, <laughs> looks mm -hmm. nice, 73 bucks. Yeah. So how do I know this isn't some uh, horror movie and somebody coming to my house isn't gonna kill me? Sure, I mean the, the whole idea of Rumorama and sites like ours is uh, transparency, right? So you have pictures, you have reviews, you have ratings, you even can see the host response rate and host response times. So, so for you, what we're doing is putting for the customer everything on an apples to apples basis. Uh, you can then compare thousands of listings at the same time and pick the one that works the best for you. And if I give the renter a hard time, it appears on your site and people avoid me. Exactly. Here's another one that's even cheaper, 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's not as nice a room, but to get a hotel in New York costs $200. Mm -hmm. You uh, started this because you travel a lot. Yeah, I love to travel. My husband and I love to travel, so we basically founded the business together because you know, we were in our mid-twenties, didn't want to stay in ho hostels, didn't want to stay in budget hotels. So we thought, hey, there must be thousands of rooms uh, and apartments available. How do we find them? How do we book them? And you started with Craigslist. We were renting our own place on Craigslist whenever we went away. Um, but at the same time, you know, using Craigslist was very uh, unreliable, uh, you know, a hassle. So we wanted because to... Because people would change their mind. Yeah, I mean, people would say, okay, book the place for me for 10 nights and then you know, when they arrived, they would be like, oh, sorry, I found something else. Uh, we couldn't make them pay us beforehand because what, you know, what kind of credibility did we have on, on an online classified? Uh, so we wanted to give, you know, people like us uh, a platform to rent out space easily. Uh, and also people like us who were traveling and wanted to find these spaces easily, give them a platform to book, uh, find and book places to stay anywhere they went. And it's taken off, continues to grow? Yeah. Despite absolutely. these laws? Uh, well, in New York, yes. I mean, you know, it's, a, again, market demand and supply. Um, one day someone gets taken off the site, someone new comes on. One legislator mm -hmm. said, this isn't fair to the neighbors mm -hmm. because you got people going in and out. Mm -hmm. We have to protect them. The yes, Hotel yes. Association of New York says people who use your site are at risk due to safety, fire, and security concerns. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are legitimate for, for sure. I mean, you want to protect uh, consumers against scammers and slumlords for sure. 
Um, but you know, I think I think this has been a proven model with Airbnb and with with us that uh, we put systems in place where we have ratings, <laughs> reviews, feedback. So if you know, again, anybody been hurt? Any fires? Any no, murders? No, thus far, no. Everyone has been pretty respectful uh, because they know it's not a hotel. And to be honest, any of those cases could happen, even if it was in a hotel. And some towns uh, seem more ready to embrace this. Mm -hmm. I see Palm Springs, California has its good neighbor brochure mm -hmm. where they discuss this and say, respect the noise rules and right. they accept this reality that people want to do this. Right. And I, I think that's, that should be the case all over the world. Thank you, Gia and Tio. Are the politicians who ban this in the pocket of the hotel business? Or do they just love regulating us to death? Well, one agreed to talk to me. State legislator Liz Kruger sponsored the bill to ban renting your apartment. Ms. Kruger, why can't I do what I want to do with my property? Because you live in a multifamily dwelling. This law only applies to apartment buildings of over six units, where we all live together under one roof. and this law came out of tenants all over the city begging their legislators for help. They were being harassed by strangers in the middle of night entering their building, moving into the apartments next door. They were bringing in party crowds who were partying all night in the hallways, respecting no rights of residents, violating the fire code, the safety code, and harassing people sometimes very aggressively out of the buildings because every unit they could get their hands on was more money for these companies. Now, I believe you that there have been problems, but are you saying that nobody was happy? There weren't some tourists who were getting great deals and some homeowners or apartment owners who were making some bucks and maybe even some neighbors who liked having people in the apartment? To be honest, I didn't find any neighbors who liked it. Now, the law But they operates, don't complain to you, politicians. They did. We spent five years in community meetings with tenants all over the city of New York documenting the problems. This is protecting you and your family. Why can't the owner of the building work this out? Why do we need you control freak politicians to pass one rule that doesn't fit all? Well, in fact, this rule only applies if there are complaints. So if nobody's complaining, there are, in fact, nobody is following up. But We've if somebody actually, complains, you could be fined $25,000 now. Um, you could only be fined $25,000 if you have been doing this on an ongoing basis. And tourists are complaining. They go online. They think they're signing up for a hotel room. They pay through a credit card. They walk into a situation that is not safe, not clean. But these websites have reviews. People know no. what they're getting into. No, what? they don't actually. Not all of them have reviews. And people have been actually caught making up the reviews to try to get other people. Once you've given them your credit card and they've billed you, no matter how terrible that experience is, you end up having to pay. If it's a terrible experience, how come these businesses keep growing? Well, partly because of the expansion of the internet and the fact that there's a broad universe of people all over the world who occasionally come to New York City. You support more regulation on construction projects, bicycles on the sidewalks, you want to ban styrofoam. You ever repeal anything? Yes, actually, New York State actually does repeal laws, and I've been what? listening what to all What have you repealed? Uh, you know, I've been in the Senate for 11 years, so you would have to ask me to come back, and I would come up with a list of laws that have been okay, repealed. Okay, I look forward to that. Thank you, Thank State you. Senator Liz Kruger. Coming up, why is Kennedy running a taxi service? Your lift has arrived. Her customers seem happy. It was amazing. But is this legal, or will government soon crush her? I hope not. They better not. Why would they do that? That's next. Today, new technology makes it easier than ever to be an entrepreneur. Just as the internet lets Rumorama connect tourists to people who want to rent rooms and apartments, a new smartphone app called Lyft connects people who want a taxi ride with people who have a car and some free time. The driver makes some money, the passenger saves some. Great, everyone wins. Well, not the established taxi companies, so they turn to government regulators. 
Last year, California fined Lyft for operating as passenger carriers without evidence of public liability coverage on file with the CPUC, failing to enroll drivers in the employer pull notice program, and so on and on. This is a matter of public safety, said the regulator. So is Lyft a public safety problem? We asked special correspondent Kennedy to check it out. She became a Lyft driver. She had to go through a background check, an in-person interview, a check of her car for safety and insurance, and after that, she was in business. Your Lyft has arrived. Passengers are encouraged to get in the front seat because that's friendlier, says the company, and drivers are supposed to give a fist bump. Hello, fist bump. Hello, fist bump. Psh, you're Corey. Corey, yes. And you're? Alex. Alex. Alex and Corey. Fantastic. Where are we going? Kennedy did not put this ridiculous mustache on her car just to mock me. All Lyft drivers use them. It's a way to identify Lyft cars. After Kennedy dropped off her first passengers. Have fun, you guys. She then checked her phone to see who else wants a ride. Oh, we got another one. It's just like fishing. Mmm. Welcome to the ride. Passengers saved money. They paid less than normal taxi fare. Kennedy made some money and gets to keep most of that. She's happy. This is so much fun. Passengers are happy. It was amazing. Quick, easy, fun, very sociable. So this was a good experience? This is the perfect marriage of entrepreneurship and capitalism and technology. This was a great experience. I would use this platform. It's so easy to use, and it was really, really fun to be a driver. All right, so how does it work? No money changes hands. It's all by credit card. Yeah, you put your credit card information into the Lyft application. You also have to have a Facebook account that matches your credit card number so they know you're a real person, and they check your Facebook friends to make sure you're not a minor or a sicko. And over time, drivers rate passengers if there's a passenger who's a problem? Yes, it's, it's like eBay or Airbnb or these other companies where you have incentive to deliver a good service and to be a good customer. You rate each other. So when a passenger got out of the car, they rated me. When they got out of the car, I rated them. And how, do you, how does Lyft make money? Lyft makes money by donation. I think that's one of the ways they're able oh, yeah, to they operate. Yeah, they call it a donation, not yeah. a cab fare. And, and I don't know if it's you know some sort of charitable organization and that's how they skirt taxes or liability or whatever, but whatever the case, on your phone, you decide what the donation is. There's a suggested donation for however long or far your ride was, and you can add, they don't call it a tip, but you can add a little something onto that. And if you're cheap or don't pay the recommended amount, you the next driver knows and might not go to pick you up. That's another incentive for being a good customer because you're bumped up in the queue if one of the drivers is looking for people, A, who donate well, or B, rate drivers with a high star rating. So the regulators said, this is a public safety threat. You know what? When we get in our cars, it's a, a safety concern. It's the most dangerous thing we do, but some people don't want to drive, and they don't want to pay money every single time for a taxi. It's a great alternative. And you, they did check you out? Oh, the background check was so thorough. We actually had to wait an entire week to shoot the segment because you go through a criminal background check, a DMV check. You have to show proof of insurance and your driver's license. They have my social security number, so... I'm actually a little worried about why, this. Why do they have to have these things? Oh, the, come on. You know the, the power of the stash. Need you ask? I mean, so it's, this, it's this great way. branding. So people see the pink mustache, like, what is that? I see these all over the place. And that's how you know your lift has arrived. So not only can you see on your phone your car is approaching, you look up, you see the pink stash, and like when I see you, heaven on earth, angels are singing. So far, lifts only in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, but they're expanding rapidly. This sounds great. I, I love this idea. It's a great idea. It really is. It's so easy to use. You don't have to pull out any cash. And drivers and customers are thrilled with the service. Thank you, Kennedy. Let's hope the regulators don't kill it off. Next, some more good news. Once or twice, government has actually repealed regulations. And the result, great. Consumers save money. Business is innovated. We'll tell that story next. People complain about high taxes, but when it comes to the war on entrepreneurship, this pile of rules is just as damaging or worse. 
because sometimes taxes get cut, but the rules, they never get cut. They just pass more of them, thousands of new pages every year. Is there no hope? Well, there is, because when I said rules are never cut, that's not entirely true. A couple times in American history, bureaucrats have actually said, let's repeal something. And the results have been terrific. Economists Wayne Layton and Edward Lopez write about that in their book, Mad Men, Intellectuals, and Academic Scribblers. So what's this title mean? Academic scribblers are people who come up with ideas, new ideas. Think of some professor at a university somewhere. Those ideas do nothing until they're picked up and made popular. This is the role of intellectuals. Intellectuals may be writers for the Wall Street Journal or New York Times. They could be talk show hosts, preachers, teachers, even television show hosts, John Stossel. They're people who take ideas and spread them out. And they say, those ideas, those are dangerous, but that idea, that's something to make popular. And, and it's the madmen? Ah, the madmen are politicians, people who hold the levers of political power. And when an idea becomes very popular, madmen have every incentive in the world to give the people what they want. Well, why do you call them madmen? They're not all madmen. It's a play on words from uh, a phrase by John Maynard Keynes, the gentleman who gave us more government spending from the <laughs> 1930s. He said, madmen in authority, who are voices in the air, are simply distilling the frenzy of some academic scribbler. All right, well, let's talk about these few wonderful times when rules were removed. Uh, airlines. Airlines used to be regulated, the, f the fares that people would pay, by the federal government. And in the 70s and 80s, we went to the open market. And what has happened since? Good things have happened. From 1930s to the 70s, there was the Civil Aeronautics Board, and no airline could raise a price or change a route without their permission. And no new airlines were approved all that time. No JetBlue, no Southwest was allowed to compete. And this was changed by, of all people, Teddy Kennedy. Teddy Kennedy was one of the madmen in authority who saw an opportunity to create a different set of rules that govern this industry and make a name for himself in his political career. And what probably woke Senator Kennedy up is that he was in Boston flying to Washington and he noticed hey, the fare is 196 bucks in today's dollars, but L.A. San Francisco, about the same distance, the fare is less than half that. What's going on? The L.A. San Francisco market was within the state of California, therefore not regulated by the federal government. Boston, D.C., that's travel that crosses state lines. That means the Civil and Aeronautics Board has jurisdiction. They regulate, they set the fares, and those fares were higher. More than twice the size. So even politicians could understand that. They deregulated. Prices are so much lower now. In today's dollars, the price is about a third of what it was. If you look at the data across the board, in the last 30 years, airline fares are down 50%. And that includes the baggage fees that we're paying now. Another good news story. Is in, the, in the 70s, there was something called the Interstate Commerce Commission, mm. which did what? The Interstate Commerce Commission regulated shipping by truck and by railroad. And they, they were, said, we have to or they'll be, mm -hmm. oh, you'll be overcharged by these greedy companies. People say that regulation is protecting consumers from greedy companies overcharging them. But when you actually look at what happens, shipping rates were very high, very high under the ICC. And once the ICC was removed of its power initially and then eventually abolished in 1995, what happened to shipping rates? They went down just like airline rates did. The politicians said, you can't deregulate, the rates will go way up. They went down. That's right. So our, our final example of one of these rare deregulatory processes, this one's still going on, the spectrum. It started in the 1930s. The politicians had administrative hearings, which basically meant one bureaucrat said, you get it and you do not. And this went on for decades. Then the federal government moved to lotteries, which basically meant someone literally won the lottery, got the license. Finally, in the 1990s, and then sold it for a ton and of money. sold it. A little old lady wins the auction, wins the license at a lottery, and then sells it to AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile, makes millions. But Auctions now the them. academics said, auction them off. Some professor named Ronald Coase at the University of Chicago goes on to win a Nobel Prize. But when he proposed this idea, he was ignored. Officials at the Federal Communications Commission that regulates the airwaves actually mocked him. And yet it happened. It took unbelievably long. It was even supported by President Carter and President Reagan and President Bush, but finally could only happen under President Clinton. The push came when they needed the money. 
President Clinton wanted to balance the budget. The Republicans in Congress also liked that idea. Where's the money going to come from? It wasn't about being more efficient. You had that final push. We can actually raise billions of dollars for the Treasury. Let's try this. So it can happen if the politicians think they'll make more money from it or if you get the Democrats involved. That's the story. We have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wayne Layton and Edward Lopez. Next, how cheap bus travel and the wonderful website Intrade were both killed by the politicians' war on the little guy. America's filled with little businesses, good ones, that were crushed by government, like the Chinatown buses. These Chinatown-based bus companies like Feng Hua and Lucky Star are packed every hour with bargain hunting riders. It's the easiest, it's the most convenient way in New York and it's only cost $10, you can't beat that. These new independent bus companies figured out that if they pick people up right off the street, going without a bus terminal, they could save money and offer very cheap fares. Passengers are pleased, but the American Bus Association is worried. It fears the future of the motor coach industry could be threatened by low-priced Chinatown buses, which it claims are dangerous and operating illegally. Companies that operate at a, at a substantially reduced cost, one-fourth of what it might cost most operators to operate in today's environment, uh, have to be almost cutting corners somewhere. Government quickly sided with the unionized bus companies. Most Chinatown buses must have cut corners. Quickly, the U.S. Transportation Department announced they had a study that showed Chinatown buses were a safety risk. Seven times greater chance of fatalities. That is unacceptable, and it will stop. Seven times. So the government forced 27 Chinatown bus companies to close. But that study, which Senator Schumer had requested, turned out to be bogus. This month, reporter Jim Epstein found that the bureaucrats mangled the data. They counted Greyhound buses as Chinatown buses and made other mistakes. Turns out the Chinatown buses were about as safe as others. But the truth came too late to help those entrepreneurs and their happy customers. Today, most Chinatown buses are out of business. One more example, Intrade.com. It was a prediction market where people could bet on anything political elections, American Idol winners. Year after year, Intrade predicted Oscar winners correctly. Thank you so much, thank you, thank you. And Intrade odds were great predictors of election results. Last presidential election, while well, Karl Rove was still saying this. Look, I, I, I don't know what the outcome is gonna be. Intrade had declared Obama the clear winner. Better said he had a 99% chance of being reelected, and a half hour later, Brett Baer said this. We have called this race for President Obama. For years, in-trade predictions were more accurate than all the pundits on all the networks. Prediction markets were accurate because they represent the wisdom of lots of people and people serious enough to bet their own money. But we can no longer rely on those wonderful in-trade predictions because last year the U.S. government declared that in-trade didn't have a license required under Dodd-Frank. So the government put it in its clear prose, Intrade violated Section 4CB and 9A3 of the Act. Sections 6CB and 13A3 2E as amended by Todd Frank to be codified, etc. You get the idea. The full regulation is somewhere in this pile of boxes. In plainer English, the regulations complained that Intrade allowed Americans to buy commodity options without American bureaucrats' permission. Seems fine to me. They say that's illegal. Intrade might have tried to get permission, but it was a small company and it was likely the bureaucrats would have said no. Because at one point they simply said prediction markets are contrary to the public interest. So Intrade gave up. It's now out of business. We're deprived of accurate predictions. When government crushes little guys, it makes all of us poor. Losing in trade and Chinatown buses are just the visible losses. There's much more loss that's invisible because this regulation scares entrepreneurs out of even trying new things. Opening a new business is hard enough without having to fight government too. So we lose innovation. We have no idea what cool new things we might have today were it not for all these rules. So, solution is to get rid of most of them.
implement the Stossel rule. For every new regulation passed, repeal 10 old ones. Would be a start. That's our show. Thanks for watching.